So if you had any advice to give to people like your friend Luke, what, what's the, the, the premise of this documentary? The premise of this documentary is that there's no magic bullet in our society. Uh, you can't take one drug that's going to make you better. So the premise is, is that you have to be aware of what works and be patient and practice until they become your friends and they become an ally rather than an enemy. In my case, the main thing in the toolbox was what I called my BAST, Bob's Amazing Support Team, because I wanted to feel better and I could call people. And for that short period of time, they made me feel better. But when they hung up, I felt desperate again. And the key was is that because I had more than one person in my toolbox and different kinds of people in my toolbox, and different kinds of people in my past, and it allowed me when I really felt down. And actually then people called me, and it was something that I, I looked forward to. My name is uh, Michael Halbert. I have known Bob since grade eight. Uh, I transferred into St. Andrews uh, Junior High. Uh, I was a real newbie. I really didn't know anybody. My social skills were horrible. And then I saw this guy, Coven, who hung out with another guy named Linder, and Coven was everywhere. Everyone knew him, everyone liked him. He was all full of energy. He was just the kind of guy I wish I was, but I wasn't. Hi, I'm Greg Bandler. I'm a good friend of Bob Coven's. Oh gosh, I'm just thinking back. I've known Bob, oh, it's a sign that we're all getting older. I guess uh, 40 plus years now. Met him first on the ski slopes at Beaver Valley. Uh, he's a great freestyle skier. Uh, there's a hill there called the Avalanche, big bumps, spring skiing. We had a great time skiing the moguls and that was kind of how we initially bonded and just uh, our relationship took off from there. My name's Brian Moran. Um, I live in Toronto, um, but I met Bob about 24, well, a little longer than that, uh, probably close to 30 years ago. My name's Peter Chandler and uh, I was born and raised in Toronto. Uh, I met Bob um, through some mutual friends. Uh, he'd gone to Western, as had they, and we met in our early 20s, and while we were both from Toronto, we'd come from very different backgrounds, so quite different, but we had almost an immediate connection because we had some things in interest that well, I was aware of right away. We both enjoyed a laugh, and we both enjoyed people and a good time. I'm uh, Rabbi Yossi Saperman. I'm the senior rabbi of Beth Torah Congregation, and I've been here for 22 years. My relationship with Bob started much like any beautiful day that turns into a tornado. It looks beautiful. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there's this wind, and there's a blast of air and you find yourself spinning and all it is is dancing with Bob out of nowhere, this blast of energy. So I'm Jack Langer. I'm one of Bobby's oldest friends. And I'm Fern Shirkin Langer and I'm married to Jack Langer. And I'm, since I came in early on, I'm also one of Bobby's oldest friends. Well, I, I've known Bobby since I was two and he was three. We lived across the hall from each other. Our parents became friends. Our fathers were both surgeons. So we hung out together a lot in those days before either of us actually remembers. You know, I've known him since then and we went to high school together, junior high and high school together. Um, and he was always the life of the party. He was a very charismatic, high energy guy. Um, and it was always very successful, but it, he always had a lot of anxieties as well. Hi, my name's Patricia Rockman, and I'm a very long friend of Bob's, and I have known him for over 20 years, from when we had a place in the Beaver Valley. And I'm also a physician and work in the area of mental health. So I first met Bob at the Beaver Valley Ski Club, and he was a big snowshoer and we had a place there and I really hated winter and we had three little kids. Bob 
started taking me snowshoeing uh, all around the area and it was really gorgeous and we would go for long hikes and talk and uh, that's when I started to get to know him and to start to understand some of the issues that he was dealing with. Bob um, started having some issues coming up, which was really surprising and shocking to a lot of us. On some level, I guess it shouldn't have been, but we just knew Bob as being this amazing, high energy, focal point of the entire room kind of guy. When he went in, it was like a magnetism. Everyone drew toward him one way or the other, partially because he's so loud and crude, but partially because he just has that kind of energy. Um, but I guess there's another side to that, too, that started to come out. He was in his car, truck, whatever it was, somewhere north of Toronto, and he had a cracked windshield, and that just shut him down. You know, cracked windshield usually means, am I okay? Is the windshield okay? Now i got a pain. It's going to cost me money. That's it. Get it fixed in a day or two. For him, that was, uh, that, that was colossal. He moved up to the Beaver Valley area, and... Um, it was in and around that time, the more time he was spending up there, it was, it was interesting because he left Toronto where he was struggling a little bit in terms of employment and whatnot, and moved up to Beaver Valley, um, which everyone thought was a great, great move for him. And, you know, he was living, I think he would describe it as living the life of envy. He could go skiing anytime he wanted to. He could go fishing anytime he wanted to. He could bake a pie and eat the whole thing anytime he wanted to. But it was in and around that time as well. The more time he was up there, the more isolated he was becoming. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's when he really started to have some struggles, I think. I occupy a bit of a unique position in Bob's life because while I'm part of his team and his supporter, I'm also his rabbi, which means that I uniquely get to engage him in a way that most people don't, in which I can be speaking the entire time on the pulpit and Bob doesn't say a word to me, which is very rare. Now, when we do get a chance to speak, Bob and I have a clear understanding that there is no other way to talk other than frankly, openly, and honestly. We share the truth about ourselves. We're not afraid to admit our struggles and our failures. And it's been challenging to watch Bob absorb his failures as though they were his narrative and forget all his successes. Our relationship became really, really candid. And I did find myself more and more just flat out disagreeing with him because I would get, I would get, I think, tired of the negativity that he would throw at me about how nothing is ever going to work out. Um, you know, he has nothing but bad breaks. Nobody cares about him anymore. These sort of messages, they come up a lot with, you know, depression and so on. And so on the one hand, if I'm trying to be a physician, I can be supportive. But on the other hand, being a friend who's just known him forever, it gets really tiring. And I would just get pretty blunt with him and disagree. Bob went through a number of changes. Uh, some of these were work-related, so economic changes, relationship changes. And he started to really experience some issues related to mood and increasing levels of anxiety. I can tell you that he certainly educated me and so many other people when he first found this Mood Disorder Association of Ontario, they had a group laughing like crazy, and we went to a performance. And I was like, I don't know if this is for you, Bob. And he went and he did it. He had a goal and he pursued it, and he went to the course every week. He graduated from the course. He did a routine at the end with all the other people that were in it, and he's he is there, he is your advocate. If you need him, you have mental health issues, he is there for you, he talks to you, he tells you there's no magic bullet, as there isn't. It's hard work and you have to work through it. Hello everybody. Hello. My name is Crazy Wild Man. I don't know if it's a nickname or a diagnosis. <laughs> Went and saw my psychiatrist and I asked him for his opinion. He said, you're crazy. <laughs> I said, I want a second opinion. He said, you're ugly. <laughs> I said, seriously. He says, you have Tourette's. 
I Googled it. Is Google a man or a woman? A woman knows everything and tells you what to do. So I looked it up and it said, uncontrollable social utterances with body twitches. So they said, would you like to try medical marijuana? I said, try it. I've been self-medicating since I was 15. For my 16th birthday, I got a bomb, and my hockey team was sponsored by zigzag rolling papers. <laughs> if my Tourette's has a triad, it has ACD or ADD, OCD Tourette's, and now I have a fourth problem. I'm delusional. I think I'm a comedian. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I, I think Bobby is, um, has matured as we all hope we do as we get older. But I think he's got a lot more insight now uh, into what happened and, and why it happened and how he can prevent it from happening again. He's got a lot more inner strength, I think, than he did uh, after going through this process. It's like uh, you know trial by fire. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think that uh, that's what's happened with Bobby now. And he's not only gotten back up on his feet and, and, and healed himself, but he's now gone to the next step, which is to try and help other people. And that's fantastic, because he's, he's uniquely positioned to help other people who have various types of mental illness, because he's been there and he's, and he's uh, survived it. You're watching The Morning Show on Global Kingston. Wishing you a great Thursday morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Bob Coven joins us. He is part of uh, Absolute Comedy Night that's taking place October 17th. Bit of a fundraiser for uh, Youth Mental Health Initiative at Hotel Du Hospital. Uh, representing that angle, we have Nicole. Uh, and Bob Coven jo joins us, uh, who is a, is a stand-up comedy. Nothing funny about mental health issues, but when you have a night of comedy supporting that endeavor, that's okay. Yeah, it's a tough thing trying to make mental health funny, but uh, I do it because it's a way of reducing stigma and letting people know that they can laugh along with other people that have mental health. You've dealt with it for years and years. I know I've publicly admitted that I have as well. And uh, there's, that, there's that lightning bolt that hits you one day where you realize there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not an oncoming train, that something can be done and you can cope. That's right. I've, uh, you know, I've had it all my life. I have Tourette's. Uh, which is a form of uh, mental health. You know, it has ACD, OCD, Tourette's. Now I have a fourth problem, I'm delusional. I think I'm a comedian. So Bob, it's wonderful to see you. Welcome to Toronto. Toronto, Toronto <laughs> Island, look at this, this is fantastic. <laughs> it's beautiful here, I love it. Tell me more about uh, what they can see when they see your documentary, No Magic Bullet. Well, it's about the toolbox, and there's a bunch of stuff in the toolbox. Uh, the main one is my tremendous support system mm -hmm. called my BAS, Bob's Amazing Support Team. Yep. And then after that uh, is the mindfulness mm -hmm. and the exercise and all the things that I've sort of customized, including the sunsets that we talked about oh, so the beautiful. last time. So hopefully people will see that if they can customize their toolboxes, they will be able to avoid the uh, stress of COVID and isolation. Yeah, so now that you've brought up the sunsets, can you just give us a little snippet about what that, what you're trying to accomplish with all of your beautiful photography? Well, I wasn't trying to accomplish anything. I was just taking sunsets. And the next thing you know, people in that uh, have are in cancer treatments, mm -hmm. I'm sending it to them and they're, they're finding energy from mm -hmm. them. And nobody ever says anything negative. They love them, oh, they're, they're fantastic. They're, they're, uh, they're they're great. It's almost a sense of, of mindfulness and mm -hmm. it didn't cost anything. I didn't have to get a set. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to travel anywhere. I just go outside my house and take mm -hmm. sunsets. Aren't you lucky to live where you live? It is just, you know what it is? It's so calming and yet inspirational and very soothing all at the same time. So I can imagine certainly for people that are experiencing any kind of difficulty that that would be just a, a beautiful thing to be able to share. Well, I think it's a definitely representative of sort of what we've developed mm -hmm. over the years. This is something that just we segued into yep. and if we can give it to other people and they can use it, just one person, if one exactly. person can, we've talked about this, if Absolutely. one person can use this to help themselves, 
then it's great. Cooking, baking specifically, is one of the things that I have in my toolbox that I've developed because it's something I enjoy, which is very important. But more important than that is it helps to calm what I call my monkey brain. You need to be organized. You need to have the supplies. You need to time things. And it's just a whole process where when you're doing it, you find that hours turn into minutes. which is the key to a lot of things that I do because the most unrelaxing thing for me to do is relax. And of course, at the end, the reward is a healthy dessert as you cut the sugar in half. You know what ingredients went into it and it helps to add to your healthy lifestyle, which is key to controlling your mental health as well as your physical health. I was never really exposed to what, I guess, mental illness was and what it was capable of doing. Individuals have given him not just medical professionals or uh, other people dealing with the same situation, but he has taken this um, situation and really um, leveraged it. And nothing has made me happier than watching him give back to those who are still suffering through it. Um, the best story I have was my dad went through a, a CAMH program called Laughing Like Crazy. And it was a 14 week, I think, comedy school that taught people how to create a comedy skit and develop a comedy skit to help them with their anxieties or their depressions or their um, red tape, so to speak. And I remember my dad calling me up saying, Aaron, are you gonna come to my graduation? It's my last one. I've worked hard on it. It's at the YMCA up on college and uh, young. I said, Dad, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there. I promise you I'm going to be there. And I was working, working, working at King and Bay. And I remember looking at the time and jumping up and in a fast pace, ran to the subway, got to the YMCA with my coat over my shoulder in the rain to be the last person showing up to the hall and I felt like, wow, I feel like I'm the father right now, late for my child's uh, <laughs> graduation. Probably four times, five times in the last 20, 25 years, Bob's hit pretty well bottom. Managed always to get out though. And this is the thing that makes Bob, Bob Coven. It makes him uh, my brother, who I'm very proud of. So yeah, so in, in overall, uh, my my big brother Bob Coven, who I admired when I was four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, uh, I admire now, and I'm 57 almost, and he just turned 65, and uh, it's great. I don't know if Bob's unusual, but he he was I think he was attuned to his his experience, like he was attuned to his personal experience, so he was able to um, name it and speak to it. The only thing is he couldn't get over it. Like when you're in it, it's very hard to kind of see. So it is about um, installing hope and to, to not stigmatize it, like just to put it out there and uh, make sure that people know that there are people there to, to help uh, professionally um, and in including, including his, um, his family and friends. But uh, I think because Bob, is sort of unusual that way. Maybe not unusual, but he, he, he was receptive. He was definitely receptive, and he didn't disappear. So he made himself available, which was helpful, very helpful. Meditation or mindfulness is something that I've been working at for years, 
and it was very hard. It actually took seven years for it to become my friend. But now that it's my friend, I look forward to doing it on a daily basis. I learned from my meditation because I follow, I follow a guided meditation. And even though I listen to the same one, which is 20 minutes of guiding and then another 10 minutes of just sitting, I explore and I hear something new every time. So mindfulness for me is typically a way of controlling my monkey brain, my thoughts, and really has been one of the main tools that I have used to get continue on my path to recovery. Fly fishing is another tool that I really learned from my father and a number of other old guys. It's not something that you can YouTube. It's something that you practice and you can never perfect. But for me, it is being in a zone that, again, hours turn into minutes. It's every cast is different. It's beautiful. It's the pursuit of non-friction. And I can go for hours seeking the fish, looking for it, hooking it, and at the end, catching it, and then releasing it to let it go again. So it has both a physical attribute because I'm walking down the river over uneven surfaces for a couple hours, but it has the mental mindfulness, it's a form of mindfulness uh, that I use effectively to calm my monkey brain. And I think his recovery is, is, is truly uh, inspiring and, and really amazing um, because I did not see that happening uh, anytime soon. And it did happen, and it happened more quickly than I envisioned. Um, and so it's a happy circumstance and a happy, happy occasion because Bob really did make a recovery. And, um, and now he's giving back, which I think is really cool too. Um, he's not just putting it in the back burner. He's actively trying to help other people go, who are going through this situation or a similar situation to him. And that's so commendable. We all know that walking and exercise is key to mental health. I just enjoy a good walk. And it's a walk in a forest so that I can walk mindfully. And once again, hours turn into minutes. I've made a choice to live in nature. Mental disorders are like any other problem or condition and we can think about a condition as something that impairs somebody, you know, whether that's functioning or they're suffering in terms of symptoms of distress. And these are things that really come and go. And I think No Magic Bullet is a good name or a good title because they are not things that you just get rid of in an instant. And in fact, you may never get rid of them, but rather, you know, you learn to manage mental health problems as often chronic conditions or things that are going to come and go. And so learning to accept that and being willing to have what life's dealt you, but work with it as best you can, I think is really what we can most hope for. And if you can let go of getting rid of it, but rather learning to work with what you have, I think that this often can take a lot of the heat out of mental health problems. And that doesn't mean you don't still have issues, but they don't have to be so discouraging or they don't have to necessarily be a problem, but it's just something that you live with, you know, they're kind of like a companion. Gardening is something that I've inherited from my father, who always grew roses, never vegetables. But at the beginning of the year, again, it takes planning. 
takes persistence, takes patience. And over the summer, you get to see things grow. So it helps as part of my toolbox to reduce physical energy because there's weeding, there's the prepping of the beds, there's the turning over the soil, and there are the benefits again of being able to eat healthy, which is part of the process and the toolbox of making your mental health and physical health, keeping it at peak performance. So I'm very delighted and very excited to bring up my friend and who you all came to see. Give it up for Baby Bob COVID, everybody! Great. Now listen, everybody, um, I really appreciate you all coming because I wanted you to come to the best comedy club in the city, and I wanted to assure you that it was all clean. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> the vagina, the period, the MDA, and all those stories really proves that comedy is fun. Now... I had a lot more people coming, but unfortunately, they're all over 60 and they can't stay past 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a good day because there's a lot happening. We have Let's Talk, Robbie Burns Day, nobody talked about Robbie Burns Day. <laughs> and of course, the inauguration. Now this shirt that I have, I got eight years ago and I was embarrassed to wear because I hated Obama. Now I love Obama! <laughs> and I hate that guy Trump. So my nickname is Wild Man Crazy. I don't know if it's a nickname or if it's a diagnosis. <laughs> but I did go to KMH and I did have a diagnosis and they told me that I had Tourette's. So I Googled it. You guys know Google's a man or a woman? Woman knows everything and tells you what to do. <laughs> I'm the poster boy for anxiety. Who gives a shit about Clara Hughes? Why am I standing up here? Because this is therapy. I can stand up here and I can talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and you guys laugh at it. And when I do it at home, I get sent to my room. <laughs> by Cal, my father. <laughs> <laughs> told me there's going to be a lot of drugs and they were going to affect the elections. I said, what elections? They said, your erections. <laughs> they said, you know, we should take Viagra. So I started taking it. I'm sure a couple of you in here have, not the 30-year-olds, but the 60-year-olds. And There's a warning on the label that says, if you have a, an erection lasting longer than four hours, go directly to the emergency. I'd rather go to my girlfriend's. <laughs> She's a nymphomaniac. Box is something that everybody needs <laughs> and everybody's toolbox is different. And the more things you fill up your toolbox with, the more tools you're going to have to deal with them. But these aren't tools like, um, screwdrivers these are actually activities that are unique to you and they develop over time and if you ask people how many things they have in their toolbox a couple of them will say I you know I don't know what is a toolbox well a toolbox is just a bunch of tools to help you cope with your challenges I had a tremendous teacher Dr. Pat Rockman who has now started the uh, Center for Mindfulness Studies and she taught me about mindfulness, uh, how to sit. Unfortunately, it was a challenge and it took lots of practice and it was almost five years before it became my friend. Mindfulness was in my toolbox and this spot was key, key to that. What else was in my toolbox? Of course, 
medication, you know, I'm still on psychiatric medication, not the kind of medication I was on when I started with, but I still take um, psychiatric drugs. Uh, uh, I take um, to help me feel better. I mean, they're not making me feel worse. And under the guidance of my psychiatrist, uh, he suggested that, that I stay on them. So what do I have? I have four things that, in my toolbox. Uh, which was the best. Also, my comedy is something in my toolbox because a lot of my issues are energy. I have Tourette's. I've always had very great energy, lots of energy to do business, lots of energy to run marathons, lots of energy to uh, get rid of my crazy thoughts. <laughs> but it was that energy that put me into the tailspin uh, and I became depressed and could get out of bed for a couple of years. The spot that we're in right now, I sat and one of the things in my guided mindfulness um, tour was Pat talking about sitting by a river and taking your thoughts and casting them into the river. So there was nothing wrong with having the thoughts, which was something that most people would say like, they're just thoughts, get rid of them. Well, I basically took my thoughts and visualized throwing them into the river up there and watching them pass by. And as they went past by, they were gone. And that's when I understood that they were just thoughts.